So what do we lose if Paris fails? Well, we need to recognize that climate change is a resource problem. And it was mentioned already in the introduction. I believe personally that this is the most important um, uh, element of our public discussion regarding climate change today. It is not only about degrees Celsius and millimeters per year. Uh, the general public uh, does not really like these physical units and has no relationship to them. But it's about resources, about the resources that are available to humans and the natural systems. And I want to just highlight four resources. The warming that we experience will affect the resource of health. We don't talk a lot about the resource of health, except when, for example, in Switzerland, every year the premiums for the health insurance increase steadily, almost as steady as the global mean temperature. Precipitation will change in under global warming, and therefore the resource of water will be affected. You will see how. Sea level will increase under global warming, and that concerns the resource of land. Everybody who has looked at house or land prices know how precious land is to humans. And finally, the general climate change impacts, they will affect the resource of biodiversity. Something that is covered in a completely different UN uh, a convention that was also designed in 1992 at the Rio summit and which we only start to talk about very recently about these interactions between climate change and biodiversity. Resource health, of course, it's evident to you that it's not very healthy to be close to this bushfire. Uh, these bushfires have increased in frequency and intensity even to the extent that Sweden this year has experienced their first bushfires or, uh, or forest fires. But what I want to uh, draw your attention to is that there are also physiological limits of our body um, to the increase of temperature. And if it comes together with high levels of humidity, we don't really like that. In fact, we have the risk of heat collapses. And this study here has looked at a quantification of so-called deadly thresholds. That means um, a threshold where you would not survive if you uh, did labor outside under such climatic conditions. And based on model simulations, they estimated the number of such risky days and the geographical extent. This is sort of the historical extent of these um, uh, risky days. You see that India is quite affected by that on the order of perhaps 50 days per year where it's not quite good to be outside and do hard labor. Uh, other uh, regions are also uh, colored in yellow, but if you compare that to the distribution of that quantity in 2000 and 90 under a business as usual scenario, you see not only more intensive colors, i.e. more such days during a year, but also a much larger geographical extension, an extension that covers essentially many highly vulnerable countries. And you can now start to imagine what that what the consequence of that is, not only to the individuals who have to cope with that climatic condition over the majority of a year. Red colors mean somewhere between 250 and 300 days uh, by the end of the 21st century of business as usual here. Let's compare this to the Paris targets. Two degrees warming, global mean, this is a substantial benefit if you compare the two. Substantial benefit. That's the reason why this two degree target is a sensible and reasonable target. It will change, people will have to adapt, but the area and the intensity uh, is much smaller and the adaptability is really given in such a case or we can work towards it, but in this case, sorry, in this case, 
we are reaching the limits of adaptability in many countries. And that is a real issue. Resource water, this is just an impression. That was the cover picture of the special report on extreme events in the last IPCC round. Uh, and of course, the water cycle changes significantly with climate change. This is out of the summary for policymakers. It changes regionally. Not all regions are affected by drought. Some regions are affected by drought. And it's interesting to note that it's these regions that already now are challenged by the shortage of water. They will be challenged even more and pushed more towards the boundary of their adaptation capacity. Whereas other locations here in the, high lat in the mid and high latitudes get more precipitation when we don't really want them. So we will have to adapt as well, for example, with the sewage systems and with the electricity system uh, that we all depend on. So the water cycle here changes dramatically for a business as usual. Resource land, I've mentioned the third resource, loss of home and habitat. That's very clear and undisputable. If sea level rises, you will lose land and that land loss can be quantified. This was another difficult problem in the last assessment report to find consensus in the science uh, about the projections of sea level rise. Uh, we did find it. Uh, this is still an open topic and I'm looking forward to the projections in the forthcoming assessment report. But uh, given that, we have adapted to 19 centimeters of sea level rise in the 20th century, but compare that to a business as usual requirement of another 70 centimeters. So there are many areas uh, in the coastal zones where hundreds of millions of people live where adaptation is required, either technological adaptation like in the Netherlands or migratory adaptation such as, for example, in Bangladesh and other low-lying countries, Pacific Islands, etc. These are huge tasks that lie in front of us. And if you just look at the slope of these curves, the task is not over in the 20th cen 21st century. It continues well into the 22nd century because these curves will go higher uh, beyond 2100. The fourth resource, and I could go on, uh, but what I really find important is that you make a connection between climate change, which is something physical, and the question of resources. The fourth resource is biodiversity and the effect of the compound climate change impact. Compound means, for example, temperature and precipitation change, or temperature, precipitation, and land use change uh, where you have managed land. And so I, I just quote a, a recent study here that was published in the uh, transactions of the Royal Society this year on where are the locations of biodiversity loss exceeding 10% caused by either land use in um, blue or climate change in orange or both in black. And you see here for RCP 2.6, the two degree warming, yes, many areas will face a biodiversity loss uh, for various reasons. You see here a, a rather color picture, but compare this to the business as usual case here with lots of black and now in particular orange uh, colors that point to the key driver of climate change when it comes to biodiversity loss. So I just want to close with uh, the fourth uh, point here um, to address also the fact that there are the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. We shouldn't forget them when we talk about climate change. And one particular sentence in the synthesis report of the fifth assessment report of IPCC is this one. Climate change is a threat to sustainable development. If we are serious about sustainable development, we need to address and mitigate climate change. Uh, 
And I just show you here the 17 goals. They have sub goals, a total of 169 goals that should be uh, uh, ticked off and fulfilled by 2030. That's the agenda 2030. Of course, these are ambitions, but it's quite interesting to ask the following question. If we want to achieve some of these sustainable development goals, we can do only if climate change is actually addressed and limited. And here I have just a selection of these few goals uh, that are to be achieved or cannot be achieved, I should uh, correct myself, cannot be achieved is cl if climate change um, is unchecked and is unlimited. So, for example, uh, the problem of hunger or the problem of inequalities from countries and regions to regions cannot be addressed if we have ongoing and unlimited climate change. So, the climate change needs to be stabilized at a level, the Paris target, to actually be able to achieve these goals. That doesn't mean it's a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition. You can turn around that sentence and ask which sustainable development goals need to be achieved to be able to mitigate climate change. And there is again uh, here a selection. Obviously, that's a bit subjective. Uh, if I ask the audience here to all fill out, we would probably come to slightly different results. But it's clear that we need education, for example. We need also innovation and infrastructure to mitigate climate change. And uh, so you can now compare these two slides with one another and pick out those that uh, light up in both slides, which uh, are these four. And these four, I would argue, are those goals where you have to put your focus on. For example, obviously climate action, decent work and economic growth doesn't mean that the growth is measured in, uh, in, in uh, GDP, but there must be new measures uh, of economic growth, in quotes now, uh, responsible consumption and production, peace and justice, and strong institutions. Without these elements, I'm convinced we will not address climate change and climate change mitigation, and vice versa, we will not be able to achieve the sustainable development goals. With that, I would like to conclude just as a few take home messages. The science is clear. We know what's happening, who's responsible, and what options remain. They don't remain forever, as I've shown to you. Some climate targets can be lost, and the climate targets are now precisely defined. For many decades of climate research, as climate researchers, we could not say at what level one should mitigate. We could not say how much carbon dioxide we can still emit. Paris has changed that for us. The policymakers have identified these climate targets, and now we can make quantitative statements about what that means. It's also clear that CO2 emissions must fall rapidly. There's no doubt about that. Uh, there are simply no sufficient sinks to compensate the emissions that we have today. And the essential resources are in danger, health, water, land, biodiversity. And I strongly believe in this synergy between the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that ambition, and the ambition to mitigate climate change. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussions, questions, and comments you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you.